Uh, is James there? This is Jim, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Kamanzi Constable. I believe we had uh, 15 minutes for an interview. We do. You and believe right. I cannot believe that I'm talking to you. I'm sure you get this all the time, but I'm like, I'm very shook right now. Thank you so much for meeting with me. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I don't. I, I, <laughs> I am not impressed with myself, so it's all good. <laughs> it's, it's, I grew up in a little town upstate New York, and uh, I still, and I consider this to be a blessing, I still see the world through the eyes of this kid from Newburgh, New York. So it's all fun for me, and, you know, doing a book with Clinton or doing a novel with Dolly Parton. I was just down there last week, and it's like, you know, this is great. Uh, doing a book on Slotnick and meeting Slotnick, you know, it's, it's very cool. So at any rate, so yeah, so we're all uh, we're all humble and ready and whatever. Yeah, so I'm uh, you're Florida based. I'm based out of Sarasota as well. I, I know you grew up in New York, but you're Florida based now, so we have that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I talked to Stu yesterday, Stu Slotnick yesterday, and got a lot of great information. Yeah. And he said initially they had been approached by a lot of people to do the story, but they wanted to do it with you. And they said initially when they had uh, met with you, you kind of you have a lot of projects in the pipeline. Obviously, um, what made you decide to take on the story? Well, I, a, a small piece was uh, well, a piece was was meeting with Stuart Benjamin or Stuart and, and I'm sorry and, and Barry, uh, and um, uh, you know listening to him a little bit, listening to the two of them a bit, and then and then I did a bunch of reading, um, and and once I started getting the stories in my head. I, you know, everything I do, it's always you know, uh, scene, 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 story, story, story. I mean, I just did an autobiography. It's just nothing but stories. And, and usually three, four, five pages. So you just, you know, you get in, you get out. And uh, I just love the stories. I mean, you know, one of my favorites is, is one of the early ones when, uh, uh, you know, when he, he's a baby, you know, when he's, he's got out of law school, very, young, very bright guy, obviously. Um, and he used to go to that the, the restaurant where where Chin Giganti uh, would go to eat, and he bumped into him. And then and then you know Chin, uh, uh, you know his his dog uh, got brought up and taken away from him because the dog had bitten this lady. And uh, I just loved you know I loved the solution that you know the way he got bullets the dog free. And he had been warned by you got to get my dog out, you know. And if Chin Giganti, Giganti has put you on the case and you want to somehow win it. And, uh, but the notion that, that he would go find a bunch of dogs that, you know, that, 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 that look like, uh, bullets. And then, and then a woman couldn't pick the, the bullets out of the lineup and they, and they, uh, they threw out the case. I love that though. It's, it's so, and it's, it's not that, I mean, it's, he's going to figure out a way to, uh, to, to win the day. Yeah. He didn't lose the case for a decade, which was That's right. Yeah, yeah, 10, uh, 10, 10 to 12 years, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, it's, it's, and, and, and the cases and the, and the people that he dealt with, uh, you know, from, from Colombo to Trump. I mean, the Trump thing wasn't about a case, but uh, you had to do the. Uh, the prenup uh, for Molina Trump. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and so you, when you are thinking about all the projects that you have in the pipeline, so it, it sounds like it has to be an interesting story to get you involved. Yes. Yeah. It's where, you know, like, uh, obviously the Epstein thing, uh, uh, and I had done a, 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 a Tim Malloy had done, had done a, we did a documentary and it was about my hometown and also, uh, Belglade down here, which at the point Belglade was ranked the number one most violent small town in America. Newburgh was number six. And, um, you know, we thought both towns got a bad rap in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> so we did a documentary movie, won a couple of Emmys. And we were thinking about doing another one, and uh, Tim had been down here during the during the Epstein trial and, and you know the arrest and all that. And I didn't really I was really vaguely aware of the story. And I said, you know, that's a book. You got to write that. I mean, it's an unbelievable story. And 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 the, the weird thing is, so the book came out in 2016. I I knew it was an insane story. I took it to CNN. I took it to Fox. Uh, the only places that covered it were the Wall Street Journal and the Miami Herald. Then in, I think, 2018, 
uh, a lawyer for these girls who are now older, you know, he, he wanted uh, a, a lot of publicity brought to their situation. So he went to the Miami Herald and he said, here, you got, here are the women you can, you can do, you can do a series of stories, you know, so that the Miami Herald uh, uh, did, a, did a series on, on the women. Uh, and, and, and people think that's what broke this thing wide open. It isn't. What broke it open was uh, that Acosta had been the, uh, the, 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 the person who, who sort of said, you know what, we should settle this and, and we'll give them 13 months. And, and, you know, and a lot of people thought that was outrageous. I actually thought, I don't know that he felt he had a lot of choices. I, I think he was afraid that, that they might lose the case in court because uh, uh, several of the girls have been bought off already. And the ones that were left were, you know, kind of, he was afraid that he had torn up by the, by uh, uh, Epstein's dream team. Um, uh, so that got me into the whole, so at any rate, and then Acosta, uh, was appointed secretary of labor by, I think it was labor by, by Trump. And that's where the, all the newspapers and the media picked it up because of that. And then your average person, they can care less about Acosta, but they went, what about with this guy with the hundreds of young girls? And, and that's, and that's when the thing exploded. Mm. At any rate, so that, you know, uh, that's the kind of story that, you know, in terms of things that really catch, catch my attention. And, and so uh, your, your story is that out of college, you went to work for an ad agency. You actually rose to be the CEO, if I'm correct, of the ad agency. Your first book CEO comes out. Of, of, yeah, North America of, of J. Walton Cox. Right your first book comes out in uh, 1976. Um, yeah. And you don't leave to be a writer, I guess a quote unquote writer full time until 1996. Is that correct? So I don't know. Something yeah, like yeah. That. But I mean, well, you know, it, it was, um, uh, you know, the, the first book, it won, it, you know, it was, it was turned out by 31 publishers. It then went on to win an Edgar. I was 26, 27 years old, whatever. But, you know, I, I didn't make a lot of money off of it. Um, the next couple of books weren't, they got published, but they weren't terribly good. And, and I'm rising like a, a little bit of rocket ship at, at Jay Walter and, you know, starting to make some money. And then in a certain way, it's complicated because uh, the woman I was with had a brain tumor. And, uh, I feel the love of my life at that point. She died. Oh, I'm sorry and, uh, to hear that. And I threw myself into advertising, you know, for a while and rose up to creative director and then, and then the, the CEO of, of North America and whatever. And I was just writing books on the side. And then at a certain point, I went like, you know, I, got, I want to get serious about this writing thing. So what do I do well? What, what don't I do well? And that's when I created Alice Cross. And, and uh, what, what was the metric that made you comfortable leaving your life as an executive? Was it a certain amount of money? Was it a certain amount no, of books? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know metrics. But, you know, I, I, I'll give you the, I, I just wrote my autobiography, which is going to come out next June. And it's just nothing but stories. Uh, James Patterson by James Patterson, and, and I, I think it really is a good read, which is unusual in that it's just my stupid life. But I mean, but I think the stories are pretty cool, and this is a very quick one uh, about about how you come to that conclusion. I had a house on the Jersey Shore, and uh, it was a Sunday, and I had to slip back to New York to do some advertising crap, and I'm like, oh man, and I'm in like you know, a traffic jam going, going north on the Garden State, I guess it was. Uh, that traffic's going at 10 miles an hour. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to be going back to New York. I don't want to do this. I just left the ocean, and it was a beautiful day. And, and on the other side of the, of the Garden State, about every 10, 15 seconds, a car goes by. <laughs> And I had this object lesson for an hour, hour and a half. And it finally occurs to me, and this is a true story, that I'm on the wrong freaking side of the road. My life is on the wrong side of the road. Mm. I got to get on the other side of the road, <laughs> that side that's wishing by me. And that's when I said, I'm getting out of advertising. At that point, I had had a couple of bestsellers. So, you know, I had money. Uh, uh, and I, I just said, I'm, I'm out. Um, and I, and I, a couple of weeks later, the guy who ran the, the agency wanted, you know, he, he said, look, you can go all the way to the top here. You can run the whole company around the world. And I don't remember the line, but he, he remembers it. He said that, uh, uh, I said something to the effect of, I can't afford to be in advertising anymore. You know? So, uh, so off I went, but it took that kind of, you know, and it's a funny 
funny thing with people, we'll do stuff, we'll get in these ruts, we'll get into these habits, and and uh, it, it's hard. It's hard to break out of it. And But that, that simple, I'm just sitting here and going like, man, I'm on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. My life is going the wrong way. I don't have to be in this traffic jam. You know, our son, uh, he's 23 now. And, 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 you know, what I've always said to him, I said, I'm looking at stuff every, every, every couple of weeks. And, you know, and I do all the outlines. One year I wrote 2,600 pages worth of outlines plus two books by myself. Mm. So it's, uh, you know, I, I had, uh, I, I'm always blanking this guy's name. It was a reporter for, um, it was the CBS Sunday morning uh, show that they have. And he was in here and I was taking him around showing him all the stuff that I was doing right now. And I'm showing him, and he goes, this is crazy, this is crazy. And then he looked at me and said, James, you are crazy. Uh, so, yeah, but I'm not. Because maybe I am, but I, but I love the craziness. You know? And then the last question, uh, James, is I am a writer, of course, myself. I, I do a lot of write and write for a lot of places. And I know a lot of uh, writers are going to be reading this. Um, any words of wisdom? Like, should writers set metrics? Should they set goals of what they want to achieve? Or should they just write for the love of writing? I don't know, man. I, you know, it, it's one of those things. If you really, if you really want to do it and you're, you know, you, you, you kind of can't help yourself. I think that's mostly what happens. You know, that's certainly what happened to me. I think with Grisham, he hated being a lawyer. He hated certain things about it. And, uh, uh, and, he, and, and then he just, I'm going to write. And then, you know, the first book, uh, Time to Kill, didn't really, they, they couldn't sell it anywhere. They sold it to some little publisher out in New Jersey that nobody had ever heard of. And I think it's one of his best books. But he didn't care. And he went off and, and he wrote uh, uh, The Firm anyway. And then The Firm, you know, caught on big and double day or wherever the hell it was. Um, I think a lot of it is you just can't help yourself. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, another piece of it is just finding a voice and a style that makes sense. And then, you know, it depends on what you want to write. You want to write bestsellers, you want to write, you know, pieces of art, you know, it's all, you know, can a bestseller be a piece of art? Yeah, yeah, it can be. But, uh, uh, you know, with me, uh, with, you know, the cross, the uh, Along Came Is Fire Kiss the Girls were the first ones that really made it big for me. Uh, and, uh, I, I literally said, said to myself, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to figure out what are my strengths and my weaknesses and, and I'm going to work to those and I'm going to write something that's going to be irresistible or try to anyway. And what happened with that, with the long came spider, which was the first one, I wrote a really long outline, like 340 pages. Wow. And, uh, and I looked at the outline and I went, you know what? This is the freaking book. It wasn't exactly, I mean, I was going to fill it in a bit, <laughs> but this is basically, and that's where the short chapters and the colloquial style and all that came from, because it was written very simply with the way we tell stories to one another. You know, we, we, we just tell it, you know, if you wrote down, you know, a story that you tell other people and you know, it's a good story because people always laugh or go, that's a great story, whatever the hell. Uh, but if you wrote it down, it probably wouldn't have any, any great sentences. It would, it would probably have a really good beginning and a really good end uh, and a decent middle. Uh, at any rate, but that's what I, uh, that's where the style came from. And I was talking to my to the editor about it, and he said, you know, that's what happened with Bruce Springsteen when he did the Nebraska album. He had sort of put it down very simply on guitar, and he carried it around for a few months. And suddenly he said, no, that's the album. Mm. That very simple, you know. Uh, anyway, but that's so that's but I, but but finding that style, uh, uh, and and you know everything that I do, uh, you know, like like with the, with the Slotnick book, the uh, defense lawyer, I uh, I just went like I would like to read this book. This is a really cool book. This has so many good stories. You got this guy, you know, and the people he worked with, you know, Colombo, uh, amazing, uh, you know, very very smart. Uh, you know, organized crime head, interesting guy, uh, you know, starts the Italian American Civil Rights uh, League, uh, wants to talk to uh, Al Ruddy, uh, who is producing The Godfather, because he doesn't want all those racial slurs against Italians in the movie, you know, uh, teaches uh, Slotnick's son, uh, Stewart, how to walk. Or so the story goes, you know, but amazing relationship. And I went, I, 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 I want to do this story. This, this guy's story is amazing. And it, it's all the more relevant right now, uh, in particular, the, uh, uh, 
um, the subway shooting, the Bernard Getz thing, with with Kyle Rittenhouse, and, and, and yes. to some extent uh, Maude Arbery, where you you have this uh, uh, reasonable doubt because my life was was being threatened, which was the subway vigilante defense, and obviously that was the defense used uh, uh, for Rittenhouse. You know, I, I, he was he was he was he was fearing for his life. And it was it was legal for him to carry a gun uh, in New York. I don't think it was legal for Getz to have a gun, but he, but you know, they, you know, uh, slightly convinced the jury that he feared for his life. And at that point, I think a lot of people were very nervous about taking the subway and crime in New York and stuff. And they, you know, they uh, he, he won them over. He, he and, and his defense was always he always started with, "I'm going to convince the jury that that they have reasonable doubt." That was his whole thing. And he would just, okay, what, how do I do that? How do I convince them? And, and, and almost all of his, his wins were, were that. I, he probably, I might not even have taken cases where he didn't think he could convince the jury of, that there was there was reasonable doubt. So, yeah. At any rate, so I, I, I love the, the project. Yeah, the defense lawyer, uh, he also represented um, John Gotti in the U.S. Supreme Court. There's a lot of very interesting stories um, in the book. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, we'll tell the world. And, uh, I'll tell the world. Thank you, James, for this. Thank you so much for your time, and, and I wish Absolutely. you nothing but the best. Okay, enjoy the day uh, here in Florida. We're smarter than the people up north. Oh, yeah, I'm in uh, Fort Lauderdale right now, and it's just gorgeous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'm, I'm up the river, or up the, up the ocean a little bit. Okay, be good. All right, nice thank you, James. You. Nice talking to you.